Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Impact Farming Show. Today, we have the always amazing Michael Langemeyer joining us. Michael, how are you? Very good. Good. I'm so happy to have you back on the show so soon. For those of you guys that are new to Michael, I'll give you a little bit of uh, introduction to him, and then we'll roll into today's episode. So Michael is Associate Director, Center for Commercial Agriculture, and Professor, Department of Agricultural Economics, Purdue University. So today, we are going to be talking about optimism in agriculture. So before we dive in, Michael, do you want to share more about who you are, what you do, your position, all that good stuff? Yes, I'm Michael Langemeyer. I, I work at, at Purdue University. Uh, I've been I've been here about 10 years. Before that, I spent 22 years at Kansas State University. Uh, I'm originally from a farm in Nebraska. In fact, my brother, uh, brother and nephew uh, still farms uh, in, in Nebraska, about 60 miles northwest of Omaha. Uh, so that's a real, uh, real quick background. Uh, I, I, I cover a lot of different topics, but my primary area of interest uh, is agriculture finance uh, and cost of production. Uh, I cover uh, other topics, but those are the two primary topics uh, that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, excellent. So today we're going to be touching on sharing, diving into the egg economy barometer. Do you want to share more about what that is? Yes, the, 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 the Egg County Barometer is a joint project between P Purdue University Center for Commercial Agriculture and the CME Group uh, in, in Chicago. And they, essentially, they approached us in late 2015 uh, to see if we wanted we, we could help uh, with a, a, a sediment index uh, for, for U.S. production agriculture. And so we started in late 2015. 15. And so the, uh, the, the last three months of 2015 and the first three months of 2016 uh, were the, are the base period. And so when we're looking at the ag economy barometer, it, it, the, the base period has an index of 100. And that was not a particularly great time for production agriculture in the U.S. or around the world for that matter. And so the index tends to be higher uh, than that base period. But that, that's how we're measuring uh, the ag economy barometer uh, to actually create the barometer, we have a series of five questions um, that we ask uh, producers every single month. It's, it's a phone survey uh, made up of 400 uh, U.S. crop and livestock producers. Uh, we do not ask vegetable producers or uh, tree nut producers, uh, but it's pretty much all the major commodity, major crop and livestock uh, commodities in, in, uh, uh, in, in the U.S. are represented in the sediment index. Okay, excellent. So the April 2023 results are just in. Do you want to talk about the results overall? And then we'll yes. dive into each area. Yeah, the index was 123, but let's put that in context. Now, the index has really been hovering around between 100 and 125, really for the last year. And that sounds, well, that's a pretty big range. Well, not really. Uh, if we go back into early 2021, uh, the index was well over 170. And so uh, in, in mid-2021, the index dropped uh, to, to about 120, and it's really moved moved uh, very, uh, very uh, uh, horizontally uh, since then. And so what happened from the spring of 2021 uh, into, into the, in the fall of 21 when that index dropped? Well, essentially what happened is, is we had pretty strong prices in early 2021 in terms of crop prices and livestock prices, but particularly crop prices and input costs hadn't started increasing yet. As soon as the input costs started increasing in a very dramatic fashion, like they did in the summer of 21, uh, that index dropped substantially because obviously if you have higher input costs, even with stronger, stronger crop prices, uh, your margins are tighter. And so, and so we've, we've really stayed in that uh, in a horizontal position for quite some time because the input costs are still relatively high. Okay. Okay. Forgive me here. Higher is obviously better. Lower is worse. And what is the scale? Zero to? The, the index, is, it's, 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 it has a base period of 100. And so it can, it can go well over 200. Okay. Uh, it's, just, it's just relative to that base. And so there's really not a, it's really not a tight range from zero to 200 necessarily. It's just relative to that base period. And so it can shoot up over 200. Uh, the highest we've seen is 180. 
uh, which would be substantially above that base period. Uh, and the lowest has been, uh, we got, we dipped down to about 90 to 90 uh, a couple different times. And so that, that's, that's where it's been, uh, that, that's the range since we started in late 2015. So when we're at, for, forgive me, when we're at 90, is that where we see the for sale signs and producers saying farewell? <laughs> when, you, when you hit 90 is essentially what happened there was COVID. COVID oh. hit and the, and the markets dropped substantially. And that just was, when you, made, when you made phone calls or talked to producers, they were really down. They were really pessimistic and, and, and rightfully so. There was just so, so much uncertainty there. Uh, but but you know, right now we're, uh, we're kind of in that middle middle range. Uh, you know, we're not particularly optimistic, but we're not particularly pessimistic either. Okay, perfect. So in the report, I know you have a series of graphs and different areas to touch on. So why don't we jump into the first one? And I know that's the indexes of current conditions and future expectations. Do you want to dive into that one? Yes, we have we have five questions that make up the ag economy barometer, and then we split that we split those five questions into two and three, and 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 we call those sub indices or sub index indexes, and we, and so the index of current conditions is really focusing on questions just like the name implies that are more oriented towards the present time, and so we'll ask questions like how does today compare to a year ago? How does today compare? Uh, what does today look like uh, compared to what things might look like a year from now? And so that's the current kind of a 12 month window there. And then we ask a, we ask a couple questions that are more five years out. Uh, do you think agriculture is going to have good times or bad times in the next five years? Uh, and so we have a couple questions that that are longer term. And so that that's what makes up the two sub indices: index of current conditions, index of future expectations. And and what we've seen recently, and this is not a big surprise, is the index of current conditions is higher than the index of future expectations because the margins were have been pretty good uh, for 21 and 22 and 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 early. Early 23. Uh, however, uh, if you if you use your crystal ball and look at the fall of 23 uh, for crop prices, for example, uh, the prices look like they're weaker uh, than, than than the current prices, and so there's there's less optimism uh, when you start looking out uh, further out uh, in, into 23 into 24, and so that that drives down that index of future expectations. And uh, it, it, to me, it's surprising that how similar they really are because I think the margins today are considerably stronger than what they look like a, a couple of years from now. Uh, and we'll see if, if, how these indices evolve uh, you know, as, as this plays out. Okay, excellent. So let's roll into the next one. Do you wanna talk about Farm Financial Performance Index? Yeah, this is a pretty basic index. And this question is very straightforward. Uh, do you, what, do you, what do you think the prospects for this year are compared to last year uh, from a financial performance uh, standpoint? So it's a pretty straightforward question. And the index, no surprise, uh, the index in 23 has been below 100, meaning that they don't expect the margins to be as strong in 23 as what they were uh, in, in 22. And so, and so a pretty simple interpretation uh, of that chart. Uh, we've seen a, a little bit of strength here in the last month and and we, we 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 think that's due to the fact that interest rates look like they're not going to increase as much as we thought they were going to right now the u.s uh, prime uh, interest rate is, is sitting at 8.25 percent uh, and, and you read the tea leaves and read some of the the news releases coming out of the fed and other publications it looks like uh, uh interest rates are probably not going to increase very much the rest of the year and so uh, and, and so even though interest rates are very high compared to what they were a year ago, uh, that's certainly good news uh, that we're not expecting future uh, future uh, increases in interest rates. And, and as you know, uh, you know, agriculture, because we're so capital intensive, uh, interest rates are so important. I mean, we have a lot of money invested in land and, and machinery, buildings, grain bins, uh, livestock facilities. And so those assets are very sensitive to interest rates. Uh, and so the interest increases, it makes those assets more expensive uh, to purchase. And, and also, we rely very heavily on operating loans. 
uh, when we buy cattle or, 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 or when we uh, put a crop in the ground. I mean, we rely on operating loans uh, extensively because there's there's so much money involved in putting in a corn crop, putting in a putting in a soybean crop or, or any other crop you're looking at. And so and so they, we're very sensitive to to increases in interest rates. And so and so we, we think that's why the the foreign financial index is a little higher this month than it has been for the last couple of months. People are starting to get used to the high interest rates. <laughs> yeah, it takes a while to get used to that. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I think I might have even said this if it was in our last episode, but we ended up just buying 160 acres and it's been on the docket for a while, but things kind of happen in their own time, right? And it's finally time to buy. And the interest rate now compared to what it could have been, yes. Not so easy to, to digest, but you got to do what you got to do, right? And if it makes yes. sense, it makes sense. So, okay, perfect. So that is Farm Financial Performance Index. Why don't we move to Farm Capital Investment Index? Yeah, this is the this is the index. And again, it makes up one of the five main questions to go in the ag economy barometer is a question related to uh, whether this is a good time or a bad time to invest in, in invest in grain bins, machinery, and buildings. That's it's a very general question uh, like that. And and they've been telling us for quite some time, uh, yeah, really since the uh, beginning of twenty one, that this is a, not a very good time uh, to to invest. Uh, in capital assets. That doesn't mean that they're not investing in capital assets. They just don't think this is a particularly good time to invest. They may they may be investing because of uh, mitigation of taxes and other reasons, uh, but that doesn't mean they're feeling comfortable uh, investing in capital assets. So we, uh, I think we've talked about this before, but we've seen a very large increase in land values in the United States. But also, uh, when you look at machinery, the price there's some sticker price shock there. The, the prices are much, much higher today than they were even a year ago or two years, particularly two, three years ago. And so, and so that's one of the reasons why uh, the, the farm capital farm capital investment index is is hovering right around forty, uh, which again wow. the base is a hundred. And so that, that's not a very optimistic uh, scenario in terms of this being a good time to invest in, in, in farm capital uh, farm, farm capital assets. Uh, the two major reasons associated with a, with this low index, uh, we, we, we ask with a follow-up question, and that's expensive machinery. And so they think machinery is expensive, so that's why it's not a good time. Uh, and then also uh, uh, high interest rates. Uh, both of those are huge factors in terms of uh, uh, making this a, a not a fabulous time uh, to invest in, in farm capital assets. Perfect. You took my next question right from my mouth. Primary reason now is a bad time to make large investments. So, yeah, we usually talk about those together. So I, I yeah, kind that of makes sense. loop that Perfect. in together. Okay. And then the next one, we're going to roll into land. And it probably might even make sense for you to speak to the two together, short-term farmland value expectations and long-term farmland value expectations. Yeah, well, first of all, when you think about short-term, we're talking about the next 12 months. That's how the question okay. uh, is, is, is asked. And when you talk about long-term, we're talking about land values five years from now. And so that's what we mean by long-term. We're not looking 20 years out. Uh, nobody <laughs> nobody has a, a good idea what land values are going to be 20 years from now. So many things can change. But we're asking one year out and five years out. And one of the things that's very obvious, and this is, this is, uh, this is pretty intuitive, I think, is there's a lot more variability in the short-term index because, quite frankly, the short-term index follows the sediment. If, if, if they're relatively optimistic about production agriculture, they're more optimistic regarding short-term land values. Uh, if, and the long-term is really following a, a trend of its own, if you will, and really is not that volatile. That, that question is related to whether, whether uh, 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 you think this is a, a good time for someone to join the business. We've talked about transition planning before uh, on, this, on this podcast, and, and, and there's a lot of difference in opinion there. Uh, if you think that this is a a good time for some, a family member to come back to the business, you're probably fairly optimistic about long-term land values. Uh, because and, and and you know that seems counterintuitive. You say, well, I'd like the land to be cheap because I want to buy it. Well, land is a very important asset on the balance sheet, and so if you're not very comfortable with land values, you probably can't bring anybody in because your equity situation is weak. Uh, and and so that's why I think that that one there kind of has a life of its own and. And, and really doesn't have much uh, volatility. And, and the, the, the long run index, 
Uh, the long the long term financial uh, farmland value Ex expectations index is hovering right around 140. Uh, so it's a, so it's relatively high right now, and that simply means that uh, there's there's considerably more people think that land value is going to increase in the next five years, then think it's gonna decrease. If you look at the short-term index, it's closer to 120. And so there's a little bit more uncertainty in the next 12 months, whether land value is gonna increase. And, and again, because it's tracking that sediment. Uh, if we see a squeeze in margins in 23, for example, then you're probably gonna see uh, either a short-term land values soften a bit or at least stabilize. Uh, and, and so that that short term index really does follow uh, the sediment very closely. Okay, perfect. And I know the next one is this is all specific to the U.S., but we assume in Canada we follow the same trends. But let's touch on the final one in the survey: is what do you think the likelihood of Congress passing a farm bill? in 2023 is and then i think your follow-up question is what's the most important title for producers in the bill yes uh before i get to that because it's important that when we're thinking about the farm bill there's several issues here we can talk about uh, related to the farm bill i, I wanted to talk about a question that we ask uh related to biggest concerns okay. uh, and these are important as kind of a lead into to thoughts on the on the farm bill we've been asking a question recently and it, it, it wasn't in the uh, the monthly write-up, but we've been asking this. Uh, we've been asking this monthly for for quite some time now. Uh, what is your biggest concern? What keeps you up at night? And 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 uh, uh, leading the pack is higher input costs. Second, uh, very close second is rising interest rates. And so one of the things that's being debated uh, in the U.S. Farm Bill that that's very important is probably hold, it's going to probably going to hold the Farm Bill back or make it slower because they're debating this issue is what do we do about inflation? What do we do about these, these increases in input prices? We have things called reference prices in our farm bill. And, and, and the whole debate there is, do these reference prices need to change in response to the increase in input costs that we've seen recently? And so and so that that whole thing there is, is, is making the farm bill negotiations a little slower than what they would be otherwise. Uh, but maybe policy moves moves quicker in Canada today than it does in the U.S. I do not know, but right now everything moves slowly through the U.S. Congress. I mean, there's it's very there's very uh, close divide between Republicans and Democrats, and so it's very difficult for them to come up uh, with an agreement uh, with that with that with, with the numbers being so close. And so uh, one of the questions we asked is, what is the likelihood of Congress passing a new farm bill in 23? That really supposed to be passed in 23. And I was surprised that 40% said somewhat likely to very likely. I'm in the opposite camp. I think it's unlikely. Uh, but 40% said uh, likely to, to very likely. And so uh, thinking that we're going to we're going to proceed here uh, with a farm bill. Uh, but for some of the reasons I was talking about, uh, this might take a while. Uh, it, it's, it's not going to be as simple as just a uh, uh, just continuing the last farm bill. There's some issues that are that are somewhat contentious uh, uh, with this farm, but just like there always is. And and another issue that's that that gets a lot of press. I know it it does in Canada too, but also in the U.S. and the EU uh, gets a lot of press. Is what do we do about conservation practices? Uh, do we need to encourage conservation practices to a greater extent uh, than we have in the past because of the green energy and uh, and, and climate change and, and all of that stuff? And so that's another very contentious issue is, is how much money needs to go to conservation versus how much money goes uh, needs to go into the traditional uh, you know, reference price types programs related to corn, soybeans, cotton, rice, peanuts. Um, some of the some of the, the primary crops, and so uh, and so again, they're they're a little bit more optimistic than I am uh, that we're going to be going to have a farm bill by the end of twenty three, and, and it kind of a follow up question there, and this, I think your uh, the Canadian uh, audience will find this interesting uh, because you don't have exactly the same programs that we do. We ask people uh, thinking about the farm bill and, and looking by the different titles, uh, what's the most important uh, title to you, and here's the choices. Uh, commodity program, which would be our reference price programs, crop insurance, which is very important to U.S. producers, renewable energy, because for the uh, farmers are impacted by more than the farm bill. There's also all this renewable energy, green energy uh, policies, conservation. I just got done talking about that. And then research and extension funding. 
Now, some people will say, well, they're all important. Uh, we didn't we didn't let them uh, do that. Uh, we said, which is the most important uh, title to you? And it's no big surprise to us, perhaps it will be to your audience, that crop insurance won the battle there. Okay. Uh, if there was one program that's very sacred uh, to U.S. crop producers in particular, it's the crop insurance bill. Uh, right now, our crop insurance roughly is subsidized about about 50 percent of the uh, premiums are paid by the federal government. Uh, and so and so there's uh, it, it makes it very attractive uh, for crop producers to 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 purchase uh, crop insurance. But that's a program that farmers really, really like. Uh, the second one there was commodity programs. Uh, you know, and there was distant third, uh, fourth and fifth, uh, looking at renewable energy conservation uh, and research and extension funding. OK, excellent. That was amazing. A lot of information right there. So. If you don't have anything else to add on any of those points, do you want to do a wrap up and kind of summarize your thoughts for where everything stands as of April 2023? Yeah, before I get into kind of some some uh, out you know outlook thoughts uh, yeah. where things might be heading in 23 and 24, which will tie into the A economy barometer, of course, we did ask a couple other questions that uh, okay. that also are in the monthly write up that I just want to briefly talk about. We asked some questions about ethanol and renewable diesel. And, and the questions were fairly general. Uh, you know, uh, look, uh, we asked basic questions about the prospects for increased ethanol production uh, in the next five years. And, and, and it was split, about 23% that the, the ethanol program uh, will be smaller, ethanol production will be smaller in five years, 24% uh, said higher, and then the other 50% are about in the middle. That tells me that nobody knows. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, because you've got some, you got some conflicting factors going on there. Uh, you know, as we get more fuel efficient, as we move to electric vehicles, that's very threatening to, to, to ethanol production. There's no if, ands, or buts about that. It's just the timing. How fast is that going to happen? There's a lot of uncertainty, certainly related to that. But another issue uh, that's happening in the United States with regard to ethanol is we're looking at 15% blends rather than 10% blends. And so that's a positive, you know, a, a factor that, that may impact ethanol. And so that's really difficult for even economists uh, to forecast what's going to have with, with with ethanol production. So that was no surprise. We put that question in there just so we could ask a renewable diesel question. Uh, renewable diesel is becoming a pretty hot issue uh, in the United States and other con countries because it's a green energy. It's considered a green fuel. And so we asked people about uh, what were the prospects for renewable diesel in five years uh, and 14% said smaller. I was a little surprised that they said that. 37% uh, uh, said larger. So you can see the dichotomy between ethanol and renewable diesel. There's a lot more optimism about the prospects uh, for renewable diesel. And then we had a follow-up question. Uh, what's going to be the impact on soybean prices? Well, 25% approximately said it's going to be a dollar per bushel or more. That's a pretty large increase. That's getting into the six, seven, eight percent uh, increase in soybean prices, and so you can see why we asked that. Uh, this whole issue of corn versus soybean production could be turned on its head, uh, depending on what happens to ethanol uh, and, and renewable diesel. And so that 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 fit right fit nicely in with our farm bill uh, questions. But just summarizing uh, the ag economy barometer, I think there's a lot of it. There's still a lot of uncertainty uh, about the prospects, uh, the you know, you know, prospects for for decent margins uh, for the. The fall of 23. But I think when you look at the fall of 23 and going to 24, uh, it does look like the margins are not going to be as strong uh, as what they were in 21 or 22. But but what's really not, we're really not sure of right now, does that mean we're going to be similar to 19, which was not a particularly good year for production agriculture, at least in the U.S.? And, but I think around the world, in fact, it wasn't a particularly strong net return year for crop producers. Or is it going to be more like 2020, which was more of a average year? Uh, and so that's the real the, the real question mark we have right now. Uh, and, 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 and and we'll just keep asking questions and and uh, and, and looking for uh, looking for the, their views uh, on the relative optimism versus pessimism. And I and I think we'll find out here pretty quickly. Uh, you know what they think in terms of the 23 23 crop as it gets a little further along. Uh, that 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 will have a big impact. Uh, and how optimistic and pessimistic they are uh, this summer. Okay, excellent. 
I think this is fantastic. You know what I was going to say? This is almost like we're bringing the coffee shop talk online to all the producers here, right? Because you get together as producers, producer groups to kind of talk, get a feel for what's going on. This is fantastic because the farmer can tune in and go, oh, okay, that's kind of what other farmers yeah. are thinking, right? And, and one of the things that truly amazes me, and, and uh, I, I don't have any specifics to share with you today, but we're, 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 we're starting to look under the hood a little bit more uh, and look at the individual answers to some of these questions. And what we're finding is the large differences in, in, in pessimism and optimism among farmers. We all know that's the case. Uh, but it makes a lot of difference in your in your viewpoint about whether you think someone should come back to the farm, whether you think my farm needs to grow, whether my farm has a good competitive position. All of that's tied to sentiment. Those that are more optimistic are much more comfortable where they fit in the industry and 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 their future. Uh, when you look at growth rates and bringing a, a family member back to the business, uh, in this. This is intuitive. They're much more optimistic that group than those that are that are. Let's say they're 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 sole proprietors, and it doesn't look like anybody's coming back to the farm. Uh, and 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 look, they maybe got five years of, of left uh, left in, in production agriculture. Then they're going to retire. That group is considerably more pessimistic, and so and so that's one of the things that really surprises me about all of this uh, is is how much difference there is. Uh, in, in relative optimism and pessimism uh, among the 400 producers uh, that we survey every month. Isn't that human nature though? Farmers yes, are it not, is. That's just, yeah. in business, you have to be fairly optimistic and yes. especially farming. There, That optimism general would help you weather the craziness. Because if you are, yeah. I'm thinking about... Uh, <laughs> Where I go in my business, I try and be steady, the farm and this yeah. business. You got to be fairly steady. You got to see the big picture. You got to be yes. optimistic. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, and there's also, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there's also a relationship between uh, strategy, those that think more about strategy and uh, particularly long term strategy and optimism. It, it's, it's no big surprise that those that are more optimistic, they think about these things more. Yeah. Why? Because they're 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 growth oriented. They're 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 thinking what it was what does my farm need to look like five years from now, ten years from now? And it's not only size related; it's enterprise related. Am I producing the right products? Uh, the, the, those that are optimistic are thinking a little bit deeper uh, about some of those things like that. Because I, and, you know, one of the reasons is obvious: they know they're going to be here ten years from now. You've got some folks that we survey that they don't know exactly where that farm is heading, whether there's a, even going to be a successor. They don't tend to be uh, near near as optimistic, and 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 I think that's I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, that if you do have family members coming back, you're going to be thinking about this a lot more. Or if you're thinking about growing your business, you're going to be thinking about strategy a lot more than if you're not thinking about uh, growing the business. We're just we're just quantifying uh, some of those things that, that that seem very intuitive. You know, Michael, it's funny that you touch on that. I like that. I always like the mind game behind farming and business too. And I have found myself dancing with that optimism and where is the future of agriculture? And I know we always think our time is special and it's the hardest it is, <laughs> the hardest it's always ever been. Yeah. I, I realize that, but we have been having an increase in things coming at us like the yes. wars the inputs the pricing government policy about environment like there's a lot coming at you and it's easy to look at all this and go oh my gosh like be are we gonna farm in the future become overwhelmed it's yeah. easy to become overwhelmed it's it's not just 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 farming it's it's, it's small businesses in general but it's even yeah. larger businesses but i can even relate to this at the university i mean there's people that that think like the land grant university we have in the united states where you have extension teaching and research uh, they're, they're they're kind of pessimistic about where that might be heading uh, you know 10 years from now and then there's folks like myself that think well this is we've been very successful over time there's no reason why we can't continue to be yeah. successful that doesn't mean we do the same things that we've always done uh but but there's no reason why we can't continue uh to be successful and it's it, it 
it goes back to whether you think the glass is half full or half empty. I just happen to be a glass half full uh, kind of person. So that's what that's one. Maybe that's a good reason why I'm involved uh, in this sediment index is I just find it fascinating, uh, you know, that, that, you know, how this varies over time, but particularly this variability among producers. I just find that fascinating. And that's something that we're going to be digging into in a lot more detail. And we really couldn't do that. Uh, in the past, because we didn't have a long enough time series, you know, now we've got eight years of history. Uh, you know, lo particularly looking at that five main questions to go in the ag economy barometer. Well, a lot has changed in eight years. We were pre-COVID, COVID, and now we're post-COVID, and so uh, and so. This is a topic that we're going to continue to study uh, for the foreseeable future. I love it. Great conversation, great information. I'm almost going to put you on the spot here, Michael. Not almost. I'm going to put you on the spot. Does us chatting again before the end of the year about the egg barometer make sense? I'd love I, to hear more. I, I definitely think so. And, and the timing that would make a lot of sense, uh, you know, from the U.S. perspective and probably from Canada, too, is kind of that August, September time frame. Okay. Because by that time, we'll have yield estimates and we'll have a lot better idea of what that 23 crop looks like. Okay. Uh, until then, we're going to see some price volatility. Mm -hmm. And 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 that's one of the things that's kind of interesting about the, the sediment, too. We have a, a, a consumer sediment index that we kind of mimicked when we developed the producer sediment index out of the University of Michigan that covers uh, consumer sediment and has since the 1950s. Maybe it's even before that, but it's been a, a very, very long time, long-term uh, a sediment index. And, and that thing doesn't bounce around as much as the producer sediment does. Why? Well, some of the things you were talking about earlier is, is the reason why. You know, agriculture is, is, is uh, it, there's a lot of industries impacted by weather, but how many industries are impacted to a as great ex ex extent as agriculture by weather, trade. Trade is becoming so important to all these commodities. And so when you see uh, conflict between countries like that, you you right away worry, well, what's that going to do for trade? And, you know, trade's such an important piece of every commodity uh, in, in agriculture today, whether you're in Canada, uh, United States, European Union, Brazil, Argentina, it doesn't matter. Trade is it, so important that, uh, you know, that, that that's, that's why the sentiment jumps. Uh, is, is you actually see these major changes happening uh, in, in, you know, uh, uh, in all of these things, you're going to see a, a change in sediment. I could see that. You know what? Between my business cap, my farming cap, and then watching people that are employed, it's a totally different world. Like as a farmer and business owner, you're navigating, right? It almost feels yeah. like just things are coming at you. And it's it, it's hard to be even keeled in in yes. business and in farming it it takes a lot of bandwidth but and not to de um belittle people that go to work we all have our financial concerns and stresses things are a little more steady in the yeah. in yeah, that if you, just, if you did a sediment index of college professors it wouldn't move much Okay. <laughs> we have a monthly paycheck, okay? Yeah. Uh, and so it's not going to move too much. I mean, there's going to be people that are pessimistic and optimistic, right. uh, but yeah. it's not going to move a lot. We're not going to change our, our sediment that much. But agriculture is not like that. We've got we've got geopolitical conflicts. We've got weather. We've got all these things that are that 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 are that, that were that we're trying to de make decisions uh, in in this in this environment that's constantly changing. Yeah, it's it's going to change. Uh, you're going to become relatively more optimistic or pessimistic, depending what's going on. That just one last point on that. It's funny because that reminds me, I don't know if you ever seen it. There's a meme that floats around in the entrepreneur space. And I think they made one for farming. It's like, okay, normal life, you're do -do -do, right? Doing your thing. <laughs> Hopefully nothing. You're not fired, job loss, any of that, right? And then farming and business, it's like, woo -woo -woo, woo -woo, and then up and, and that matches what goes on in our world and our mindset, right? That's a lot that yeah. you deal with. So yep. anyways, I love it. Okay. So I would love to hold you to that fall conversation. I'm going to pencil that in and look forward to it. Sounds good. Good. One quick question for you. If producers would like to get the egg barometer, how do they, can they sign up or where can they access it? Yeah, they're, they're, they're month, their monthly reports available uh, okay. on the internet. And the easiest, the easiest place to check for, for information uh, coming from the center related to extension farm management 
uh, agriculture finance information, uh, transition planning, all the all the topics related to farm management. Uh, Center for Commercial Agriculture, Purdue University. Uh, there's there is a more direct link to the Ag Economy Barometer, but you can find the Ag Economy Barometer from the center's webpage, and th okay. that's where I would lead people to uh, is the center's webpage. Okay, and we'll put those links in the show notes, like always. Perfect, Michael. Thank you for your time. I always enjoy our conversations. Take care. Okay, thanks, guys. See you next week. Bye. Bye. -bye.